Hi everyone, uh, Fraud Session, thank you so much for joining. Uh, hopefully it will be simple and one of the things uh, which is very critical is the engagement. Like I, the only thing is constant in the financial industry is risk. The only thing is constant in risk is fraud. Fraud will always be here. That's why we're covering fraud. And I would like to make it a little bit more interactive just to show you what are the emerging trends that we're seeing in the industry right now, how we potentially can leverage some of those capabilities that we build either in-house or available in the industry in general to address uh, some of those uh, concerns. Um, please feel free to stop me at any point. Would like to make this as more engagement as uh, possible. This is me, um, responsible for, uh, for payments risk uh, in, uh, in Galileo, the risk capabilities, uh, the risk uh, transactional fraud, and some of the operational, uh, operational components uh, as well. So what are we going to cover today? A lot of interesting topics, but I would like to show you the landscape first, uh, demonstrate what exact, how exactly the fraud evolved over the last couple of years, what we should be expecting in the next years uh, to come, primarily around the new capabilities that are evolving in the market. Fed now, there's the, uh, the same day ACH that always create a, obviously the risk patterns, but at the same time, people are not aware what are the capabilities that they can leverage to build, uh, to, uh, to address some of those uh, concerns. So we'll be talking about uh, the, money, uh, the money movement components, the bot attacks, uh, Data breaches, which again, uh, if you think about the data breaches, the moment you, the, the information, the PII is breached, then it potentially will evolve into the money movement concern, into the bot attacks, and so on and so forth. So we'd like to cover all of those and show you at the end how exactly we are thinking to build our platform, our strategy, uh, to better incorporate any of those uh, controls within Galileo. Um, you probably have seen or at least you have heard what are the fraud losses and how they're emerging over the last couple of years. Uh, it's interesting enough to look at uh, just at one of the charts saying that the cost of fraud over the last couple of years increasingly got to the point where we are spending 4.5, 4.25 actually, well, based on the recent research, it's actually 4.5 dollars for every loss of uh, every fraudulent activity. It's enormous number, which includes obviously the operational cost, the cost of the vendors, the cost of technology, the overhead disputes, and so on and so forth. Now, is there something that has to be done about uh, those uh, trends? Absolutely. One of the other actually scary components of the fraud uh, in general is if you're looking at the amount of spend that the industry is going to generate to leverage fraud capabilities over the next 10 years, we are looking at approximately 10x uh, increase compared to the last year. We are, we are reaching $250 million by 2023. Now, the, the goal for the service providers, the fraud providers, it's not to squeeze funds from, uh, from the clients. The cost, the, the cost is primarily to mitigate any of the fraud concerns. Now, the moment you have the cost, which means the cost of the fraud will also keep increasing. Therefore, the new capabilities are absolutely necessary to mitigate any of those uh, concerns. Transactional money movement, ATOs, and uh, first party, uh, as we all know it, and so on and so forth. Um, continuous growth and fraud in general, like if you look just a couple of years back, 10% growth uh, year over year, pre and post pandemic, it is uh, amazing growth in, the, in technology that we thought at some point will be mitigated by uh, EMV, the chips, or the, account, the controls on the ACHs, which Everyone would like to leverage the EWS, the Guy Act, and so on. But apparently, as we're seeing, the, the bad actors find new ways to evolve, find new ways to, uh, uh, to find new constraints with, uh, with, our, with our controls. Fed now, uh, a component that nobody knows at the moment how we'll be able to control going forward. Fraud cases. Um, those are just the four major ones that the industry experiences at the moment. So we have uh, the first party fraud. We all know that as first party abusers. Uh, me as an individual, I have my client remorse. I would like to dispute transactions. Unfortunately, the cost of this is there's no direct way to determine whether I'm a abuser, as well as just the cost of those transactions tend to be significantly higher from the regular compromised, uh, from the regular compromised cards. So 
uh, one of the big uh, problems within the industry, family fraud, which in some cases can be attributed to the, uh, to the first party fraud as well. Like I know my fa some of my family members making transactions, I actually would dispute them just not to put my kid in, uh, or my family member in danger. Account takeover. A major problem as well in general that exists where our, all our information, starting with our credit card numbers, the bin numbers, um, our profiles, all available on the market for grabs. So everyone can potentially get our information, start creating some kind of bot attacks to spoof our accounts. Uh, bot attacks, uh, and we'll touch on this uh, in a bit, is one of those capabilities that significantly evolved over the last couple of years and uh, possess a tremendous threat right now to the entire financial industry. It covers transactional fraud on the cards, on the money movement, and so on and so forth. Um, E-commerce fraud, as we all know, the, the traditional transactional fraud, a problem everywhere. It starts with a card skimming, uh, with uh, a regular card skimming. You would be surprised to know that even now, as the industry moves towards um, EMV, is the industry moves towards a um, cards without the max stripe, which will be the new norm in, in, in a couple of years, the capabilities of skimming the cards, leveraging them in other uh, instances of uh, e-commerce still exist. The question is how we can potentially address those things. And there's a lot of capabilities, a lot of things that we can do through uh, either partnerships, create some of the capabilities in-house, continuous monitoring, operational risk, operational fraud, and so on. And obviously the money movement, which um, you will be quite surprised to see in the next couple of charts that the money movement possesses the biggest threat right now to the industry when we're talking about the funds in, the funds out, returns, and, uh, and so on. Interesting stats. Um, as of last year, 65% of, of all the companies that has any kind of uh, transactional activity, money movement activity, were subject to some kind of a fraudulent, uh, to the fraud attacks, or at least fraud, uh, fraud attempts. Over the last couple of years, we, we do see a slight decrease. This is phenomenal because we, we do have new capabilities, not technologies, but at the same time, 65% of all the industry still suffers from this, uh, from this activity. The most surprising part is if you're looking at all the money, uh, all the financials that are being schemed, more than 70% of all the funds cannot be recouped. Only approximately 30% of the funds can be fully recovered. Now those, uh, if you have to attribute those uh, to some of them, those are the natural rules where we can recoup some of the, some of the funds uh, through the push uh, by the natural regulations. But if you look at all the others, the transactional components, the Fed now, which is a real-time payment, will not be available. Uh, uh, Cash App, PayPal's, and, and, and other P2Ps of the universe, the funds are gone. So the question is how we potentially can think of the money movement controls, mitigants, uh, to basically make the entire, um, the entire industry better. Uh, the evolving, the evolving trends in the in the industry of the of the Fed now is going to going to possess another huge threat to uh, to the entire ecosystem, as more and more funds will be trying to move away from the ACH towards uh, towards Fed now for bill payment or any other uh, any other components. Do we know how much of that fraud is held? Um, I think I read somewhere that. Zell is uh, Zell has uh, enormous exposure to uh, to fraud and uh, risk in general. Um, looking by uh, looking at the numbers, so the fact that the Zell is a real time payment with the funds not being able to recoup, it all falls into forty four percent category where none of the funds uh, can be recovered, unfortunately. Now, looking at Zell in general as a, as a trend. $55 billion are transferred through Zelle every single, uh, every single month. Just if you look at 10, uh, 10 bips of those funds being fraudulent, we're looking at half a, billion, uh, half a billion dollar without any recoveries, right? Now, if you add to this the component of uh, the overhead, the operational component that is needed, so you lost $500 million, you added another 500 million in just trying to address any of those uh, fraud concerns, right? So it's not just the fraud losses, but it's also the additional parts that are coming uh, right after that. By the way, Zelle is not the only one. Cash App, um, we all heard about the, the issues with Cash App a couple of months back. Uh, PayPal, very similar. If you look at um, MetaPay, 
it's a very uh, new emerging trend uh, that we are seeing right now. And you will absolutely see why the moment we get to the part of um, exposure. MetaPay has all the information about um, individuals within the, within the Meta uh, ecosystem. Everyone is trying to pay for the gaming for the other uh, parts. Now it became also a channel for real-time uh, real payment money movement. So the amount of exposure on this one is similar or actually outgrowing what, what we are seeing right now within, uh, within the Cash App uh, universe. And you'll see the... Cash App, pay, uh, PayPal, Venmo, Zelle, all of those uh, are very easily uh, leveraged for any kind of money movement. It's as simple as putting my account number and uh, routing number to know where the funds are going. Now, if you're looking more broadly, the bot attacks that are available right now in the market for grabs, everybody can actually build their own bot. I can start generating account numbers trying to siphon the funds from the account, right? Like we all know the routing numbers, it's actually public information. The only non-public information is the account. So if you create this uh, traditional velocity control around accounts, that uh, possesses a huge threat. So as I, as I was mentioning, if you look just at the bank transfers and the payments, uh, by the way, this is only represents 19% of submitted information uh, around fraud, but the, the bank transfers at the payments only with the 20% information already possesses $1.5 billion of fraud exposure over, uh, over the last year. You, can, you would expect that the credit card would be the biggest, uh, the biggest component, and it is in terms of submitting uh, the claims, submitting the disputes and so on, which is expected. The most of uh, transactions that individuals making within the United States are through the cards, but the exposure is significantly lower. So 20%, we are looking at a couple of billion dollars overall, but on the money component, it becomes a little bit more critical. Every kind of, every single transaction has thousands of dollars, potentially, versus up to $30, uh, $30 which is the average on debit or uh, credit card uh, nowadays. And again, you can see that Cash App, Venmo, PayPal, Zelle, they all possess pretty much the same thread that we are seeing within the industry uh, overall. How we potentially can control for this thing uh, there's no secret sauce, unfortunately. It's all about what is our risk appetite, how we can start addressing those things through our existing capabilities or enhance our capabilities, <coughs> excuse me, enhance our capabilities uh, with some of the additional controls. Not sure, uh, abiding by the natural regulations because becomes almost a paramount. Like it's, it's, it's a mandatory uh, thing, obviously, for all of us to have. But then at the same time, they also have some of the very interesting suggestions against the payment holds, how to release the payments, how to uh, monitor for some of the payment originations and, and payment uh, receivables and so on. KYC, the entire scope of the money movement fraud starts with onboarding the right individuals. And this is the problem that exists in the industry uh, worldwide. Synthetic IDs, uh, our, as I mentioned before, our PII is up for grabs. So we can onboard probably the right max with the wrong address, with the wrong social, and so on, right? So all of those components has to be, uh, they have to be vetted before we, uh, we enable the clients to have a, a money movement, uh, con proper money movement uh, control. Um, odd holds, and I, I mentioned this a little bit uh, before, validating, um, validating that the payment is, uh, is valid through uh, other components, such as early warning. I know we all heard about early warning, we all heard about uh, GAIAC, how we can better leverage some of those capabilities to make the transfer uh, much better. Um, step up authentication. If I'm always transferring $5 from my account on the money movement, suddenly I have a transfer of more than $100,000, potentially it's possible in the B2B space, it's more relevant to the B2B space. We have to be very cognizant of this capability and generate some kind of friction on the client side, such as uh, MFA, client authentication, client outbound call uh, with some of the clients who potentially don't have the capabilities of client, uh, client outreach. So all of those capabilities become, uh, becomes, uh, they become critical. But at the same time, think of a broader capability around uh, the platform and the, uh, the platform that you are going to leverage. A continuous monitoring of all of those activities along with the additional services, the KYC service, the, the KYB service, uh, and so on, uh, the continuous OFAC screening becomes a paramount. So if you can embed and ingest as much information as possible into a single platform, that becomes a much better solution uh, for any kind of uh, fraud mitigation. Um, 
just velocity on its own will not solve the problem, unfortunately, and we all know that. Um, we've seen many use cases. Sorry, before I get there, any questions about the money movement? Perfect. Transactional fraud. We all see transactional fraud. We all heard about transactional fraud. The cards, the pain points that we're seeing from the clients where the client is actually calling in, uh, complaining that my card was skimmed. It's not the transaction that I made. One of the major misconceptions in the industry right now is we are coming to solve for fraud, which is not necessarily true. We are coming to solve for client experience. The fact that the customer picked up the phone, called us, complained, and we stayed on the phone for the, for the entire hour to entertain the client, first we increase our OPEX. The second one, client is not going to use the card as top of the wallet anymore. So it's gone. So we're trying to cater for customer experience. Second component of it is we're trying to cater for fraud, for fraud controls, right? So again, the OPEX and, uh, and the other parts. There are may, many challenges with uh, transactional fraud. A lot of them are around the capabilities, a lot of them around what are we potentially can uh, implement without, uh, within our solution. Um, complex and expensive hardware. If, if you went right now and uh, implemented a solution separately from your either payment processor or your network, you potentially up for grabs of multi-million dollar journey for multiple years. While at the same time, if you look a little bit more broadly into what your payment service provider can offer, what your network has to offer, they're always trying to cater certain solutions tailored for the clients. Um, like if you're in a startup mode, and we have startup representatives here, we might potentially consider as a very simplistic uh, solution that will evolve uh, over time. If it's a major organization, we, are, we have to consider the fact that the nature of the transactions will shift. The amount of the transactions will change. So we have to be able to tailor our solution for those uh, changes as well. So there's a trade-off as one company grows, the other one remains uh, somewhat stagnant or has a smaller mar or marginal uh, growth. The capability is supposed to be able to shift. So there is no one secret sauce uh, for all. And this is the, one of the major challenges right now in the industry that all these providers are trying to provide similar solution, which is probably the wrong, not, not necessarily the right approach for either major financial institutions or small financial institutions. Um, the continuous need for investment. We invested in the fraud capabilities. It, it is great. Now we have the platform. Who is going to actually tailor the solution? Who is going to build the solution? The engineering power behind it, the, capability, the, the SMEs that are needed to build those uh, solutions within the platform becomes also another OPEX that uh, everyone has to think about. So broadly speaking, it's the investment in the tool, investment in the technology, investment in the SMEs that become so much complicated where the small companies potentially will not, will run out of funds. The big companies, they don't see this as the main focus right now un unless they have a $1 million loss uh, on a single event. Um, speaking from prior experiences, I can tell you that Looking at companies like Goldman Sachs, uh, one single event worth of $5 million versus $5 million lost over 5,000 transactions on the card. Like the magnitudes and the transactional aspects of, uh, of fraud become so, so much, uh, so much different. So the catering for the information, uh, the, for the solutions becomes a paramount. How we can prevent it? Obviously, stay ahead of the industry trends. Uh, one of the things is a continuous research, what, um, what we're observing within the industry. Knowledge sharing, one of the paramounts of uh, fraud and risk is having some kind of consortium information. Uh, without consortium, we're only blind and seeing whatever we, are, uh, we have within our portfolio. Think of Galileo, think of MasterCard, think of Visa. As long as we can share the information, they can share the information with us, we can share the information with them, obviously the solution, the DI score, the VAA score. Um, many other capabilities become so much, um, so much better. Enriching the data, the, the customer data, as I mentioned before, the, the velocity itself, for example, will not solve for the problems. But if we can create the single client journey from the client onboarding all the way to the password changes, the login changes, the shift from where I'm attempting, the lo uh, I'm attempting to log in into my uh, portfolio, mapping those against the transactional part, that becomes so much more richer experience for, from the fraud, persp uh, from fraud perspective that 
um, we are seeing what some, with some of the examples that we have right now, we are seeing a reduction, immediate reduction of almost 30% with, uh, with some of our clients just by ingesting the data of the client, the client onboarding, the KYC and the CIP, uh, and the CIP parts. Um, AI, the biggest thing right now that everybody speaks, right? Uh, great buzzword. Now, it's important to know how to use AI. Um, we can do a lot of harm, we can do a lot of damage, we can do a lot of uh, good things. So our models potentially, as we embed the models, the visa score model, we continuously have to ask the visa or MasterCard to provide us with new, uh, new information. As we build our own models, a retraining of model periodically, every six months, every one year, becomes absolutely necessary just so we can adjust to the newer trends. Think of whatever happened during the pandemic time. Everybody, the entire payment uh, shifted towards the e-commerce while the models were still tailored for the brick and mortar stores. So you can see a enormous differences between the scores coming from uh, the e-commerce compared to the two years that you've seen before. Now, the, again, MasterCard realized it a little bit uh, somewhat uh, later, Visa a little bit quicker, so they were able to tailor it, but still we were, we were seeing percentage points. It's not, we're not talking about BIPs. We've seen percentage points differences between the fraud associated with lower buckets and the higher buckets. Um, so continuous training of the model, creating the models, not just focusing on one model, but augmenting the models with additional information becomes absolutely necessary. Our entire universe is digital right now, fingerprinting. And I'm not talking about our regular fingerprint, the fingerprint of our device as we're logging in into our apps, as we're trying to uh, log in into our banking accounts. Having this information as part of the input into our models, into our controls, into our platforms becomes also a necessity to have a successful, uh, to have successful controls, to have successful uh, platforms. How I'm thinking about fraud, how I'm thinking about risk, uh, and me as a uh, Galileo representative here. It's one ecosystem that potentially should accommodate multiple solutions. We should be looking at the merchant insights. We should be looking at the merchant fraud. We should be looking at the money movement. We should be looking at one single solution that will potentially expose you to a case management uh, solution that will allow you to ingest those additional data points and data components that we just discussed, such as KYC, KYB components, just so we can better understand what exactly the threat, how we can expose all of this information to our clients, how we can enable our operational team to be able to be more efficient in the disputes, uh, in, uh, in reporting, reconciliations, and so on. Um, the reporting component of this uh, entire journey is extremely critical. If we are blind to the data, we will not be able to take uh, the necessary actions. We will not be able to drive the necessary decisions. So having the right data streams, uh, providing the necessary reports, dashboards, and so on, becomes also a critical component of the entire, uh, of the entire platform. So looking broadly of uh, Galileo as a provider of the solution, we are thinking of one single platform with multiple data points uh, that will include, again, the money movement, uh, access to potentially even uh, EWS, right? Again, it becomes a very critical component for any, any kind of uh, money controls uh, that we're going to have. Interesting enough, I don't know if you know that, but FedNow is going to leverage, the, in most cases, at least for the next couple of years, the same routing numbers and account numbers as a traditional uh, ACHs. Therefore, if we are looking at ACH controls, we can potentially use the same framework for FedNow. Uh, with wires, it's a little bit different. It's a, little, it's a completely different topic, and we can cover this in some, some other time. Questions? Great. Account takeover. Very unfortunate use case that we unfortunately heard from many instances uh, in the industry. Very simple to... Uh, very simple to uh, perform. And I want to say that pretty much every financial institution right now, starting from a fintech, uh, the moment they launch their programs, all the way to mature financial institutions, JPM, Goldman, Bank of America, and so on, suffer from this, uh, from this problem. It's as easy as buying our information on dark web, generating some kind of a bot to be able to either um, find the right combination the name of the name on the password or some other, uh, some other activity. The moment it happens, it opens room for so many things. Replacing the card, changing the shipping address, uh, 
changing my uh, my information, who is uh, the the co-signer on my account, if it's a loan account, and so on and so forth. So it's not just the account takeover. Not necessarily happens just within the realm of cards. It happens within the entire payment ecosystem. Um, loans, banking, money movement, uh, transactions, business email compromises, and so on and so forth. Um, and those are the components that you can see that potentially can, uh, can be engaged as part of the account takeover, siphoning funds, which is the immediate need um, for, I want to say, small type of uh, fraud source. If you're looking a little bit more broadly uh, with fi uh, major financial institutions, the business email compromises become uh, so much, uh, such a much bigger problem just because with a single transaction, we can siphon up to five, uh, five million dollars. Um, <laughs> this is the statement that I uh, added myself, but um, it is nearly impossible to detect account takeover until uh, we are either being told, until it's occurred, until we actually have the, the necessary due diligence. Unfortunately, we will always be running behind, uh, behind the bad actors. Right, so the, the faster we can address the account takeover components, the better we are, uh, both from, uh, from the dispute standpoint on the cards, all the way to uh, siphoning funds um, through other, uh, other means and other channels. How we can prevent account takeover? There, there's a couple of approaches. There's no, like I said, there's no silver, uh, silver bullet. The, the main one is we always have to protect the client, we always have to protect the entity, and we always have to take a little bit more, um, what is the right word? The approach of looking at multi, uh, multiple channels. Uh, we, we should not be focusing just on the cards. If it's, if it's a specific individual, sorry, if it's a specific individual, we should be looking at, were there any changes on the individual PII that we potentially should be looking at? If it's the account or the account fingerprinting, did any change happen on the account? IP changes, login changes over the period of time. Uh, account linking, which is, uh, obviously happens uh, from the moment you have, the, the, moment you have the, uh, the ATO, and so on. And the ability to be able dynamic with how we are coming to address the fraud. We continuously have to evolve, we continuously have to change what exactly we are doing with our, uh, with our controls. We have to be able to address uh, the change of the, uh, of the IP addresses by creating this gener uh, or generate this necessary friction, the MFAs, um, notifying the client of any potential, um, any potential changes, all the way to an extent, unfortunately, to an extent of even blocking the account from being able to transact until the client will be able to authenticate himself or herself through a face-to-face -face communication, uh, over phone communication, or have a more robust, uh, more robust KBA. It's, it's a problem that there's unfortunately no solution that exists right now, uh, right now in the industry, but we still have to be able to take more proactive approach with controlling for any type of uh, fraudulent activity, risky activity, any kind of uh, changes that we are, uh, we are seeing on our account. I mentioned the data breaches before. I mentioned MetaPay, so it, it's not a surprise. If you look at Facebook in 2021, uh, multi-million, exposure of um, data P uh, PII elements uh, that were leaked. Now, what a surprise, a couple of years later, we start seeing all of those uh, PII's are being monetized, accounts being created, fake accounts are being created on multiple platforms. I, um, there's, uh, without naming the names of the platforms, but we are seeing that a major shift that is happening from the cash app towards MetaPay just because of the simplicity to open this account and how cheap this information became over the last, over the last couple of years. If initially it, we were looking at $5 approximately per PII, now we are looking at $5 for 100 records. And some of them, some, most of those 100 records are actually valid. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the, the shift is just enormous. The cash app exposure, the Uber exposure, the moment those exposures are happening, all of our information is up for grabs. The data breach leads to account, potentially account takeover. It leads to potential bot attacks. It leads, which later on leads to the money movement uh, fraud, transactional fraud, changing the cards, issuing new cards, and uh, spending on, uh, on those cards. Look at the cost of the data breach. One of the things that we always have to be uh, cautious about is if data breach happens, first we have to check it with, with our partnering banks, with any kind of bank. Is there a proper control available around the data breaches? Is there proper monitoring? 
if there is a monitoring, how quickly, how swiftly we can be notified about some of those uh, activities. The cost of a breach over the last year, if you can see, it's $165 per record. So it is the cost of the fraud, it's cost to mitigate, it's cost, uh, uh, it's cost to have even the client communication, processing the legal cost, and so on and so forth, right? So it almost becomes a paramount for us to look at data breaches as our foundational components, how, the, how some of the fraudulent activity can potentially start. Um, $165 is uh, for the overall. Look at the customer PII. The cost of customer PII is almost uh, $200. It's enormous number. The cost of being able to address it against the bureaus, the cost of being able to mitigate it against the client, all the client concerns, the legal concerns that the client might raise, uh, reach almost uh, $200, right? So again, the foundation of uh, the entire fraudulent uh, program should be the initial, uh, the initial data breaches. Um, and I mentioned this before, uh, on the prior slide, but customer PII always becomes the paramount of what, our what the bad actors are looking for and what our clients are suffering the most. Customer PII attributed, uh, is being attributed to 52% of all the information that, being, uh, that is being uh, stolen. So any kind of, uh, any kind of information you, you can think of, uh, phone number, name, everything that potentially can be used and leveraged to create uh, separate, uh, separate accounts can be attributed uh, to the PII. And we have to be very cautious whenever we are uh, controlling for them in our, either the storage or how we're monitoring for any potential data breaches. Tools that are available to monitor such, uh, such activity. Iovation, you probably heard about Iovation. You probably heard about uh, thread metrics and many other tools that will allow you to profile the activity at the time of the login, at the time of uh, the PIIs that are being used uh, for the logins and so on and so forth, as well as the transactional component are very critical to have um, some kind of uh, baseline controls against data breaches and client authentications. If I have an account with Bank ABC as an example, and I'm opening another account, obviously the bank has the ability to link the information. Now, if one of my bank accounts is attributed with New York State, another bank is attributed with California State, great. This is the first flag that we should be looking at as our accounts are being compromised, as our accounts are not in the right, uh, in the right state. So one of the major concerns there. Um, selling the data, like I said, $5 for 100 records, I mean, it, it becomes almost a crime not to use it for crimes. Right, so um, it is just so cheap that we, the bad actors, obviously, they they know how to leverage it, and we have to be much more, much more proactive. Uh, around. I just want to talk about this because I have an anecdote. It's almost impossible to prevent data breaches. Uh, I'll give you an example. I got a letter once from some company that I've never, I've never heard the name. So. They sent me a letter saying that my data had been compromised. It was my name, my social security number, and my bank account. Um, and I was really upset because they sent that letter like a year and a half after the data breach. Yep. But I was more, yeah, so, so I called them up and I was really upset uh, in a conversation with them. But I was more. I never knew the name of the company, and I was like, I've never done any business with you. How did you guys have my data? And then I found out that it was one of my previous employers who had actually contracted with a tax firm in California who yep. was creating the W-2s. And that tax firm had contracted with another third party yep. to store their data. Uh, so it was, you know, it was just like, and then I called my HR at the previous company. They had no clue. Obviously, I sent them an email. They didn't respond because they had liability issue. Next thing we know, there's letters sent out to all its employees. But you know, at that point, I'm thinking there's there's no way I can control this stuff, right? There's, it's it's being spread all over. Think of the hassle, and this is, goes back to the to the cost of the data breach. The fact that you had to be several several hours over the phone they had to issue a legal letter to you and so on and so forth it becomes just a huge hassle to everyone, right? Now, another problem that exists in general in the industry is the fact that when the data is being 
a lot of the data is being sold, right? Data aggregators buy tons of uh, data, uh, information. If they're being compromised, think of the ability, think of how much more information is being, uh, uh, being out there for grabs. On the, on the previous slide, you, you probably saw like Pathboard. Unfortunately, they had an incident uh, a couple of months back that they, uh, that they declared. Not a big exposure, 800,000 uh, 800, uh, accounts, 800 individuals that were uh, exposed. Now, if you think of the data aggregators that buy information from Pathboard, from Bank or Bank of America, and so on and so forth, you have hundreds of millions of accounts, PII's information that be, is being sold. Now, it, Hargi, to your point, it gets to the level where you're getting legal letters from entities you've never heard about, but at the same time, you're not aware at what stage your information potentially was breached, was compromised, such that you can start mitigating it all the way upstream, right? You're only focused on this last one instance. So it, it becomes a, a major, major problem in the industry right now. And again, as I said, it's one of the foundational blocks for have a decent, uh, decent risk program in general, not just fraud, risk program in, uh, in general. <clears throat> Bot attacks. Think of the use case where the data is being breached. Everybody knows who is Max. Everybody knows my first name, my last name. Well, not, not so much of a traditional name, but if you have Jack Smith, for example, right? The chances of having the same Jack Smith in the United States probably is somewhat higher than Maxim. Now, the only thing is left is, can I generate a bot to potentially create a password to be associated with this Jack Smith on Bank of America, JPM, and so on and so forth, right? So creating a bot, generating a bot, the cost of uh, generating one is approximately $15. It's a very cheap technology to, that allows you to generate to create a lot of damage, a lot of noise. So creating one, associating one with uh, one of the accounts and start running it continuously creates a much bigger threat just because of the data breaches. So it's one of those things where we can have e-commerce fraud, application fraud, like th the fact that I can breach the account, I can change information, but then I can apply for additional accounts. I can open lending accounts. I can tell you actually uh, one interesting scenario in my prior lives. We all heard about micro deposits. We all know what micro deposits. Um, the way it works, I'm extending someone six cents, four cents, just to validate uh, what is the amount. The moment uh, I'm validating the amount, in most cases, the banks are not clawing back those four cents just because the cost of submitting a NACHA file actually is five, so it's much more expensive. Now, think of an example where I'm creating 100,000 accounts with micro deposits that I'm not touching, the next thing I'm doing is I'm siphoning those 100,000 deposits into a separate fund. So I have 100,000 uh, 100, accounts with five cents siphoned some, uh, somewhere else. I just did uh, $5,000 without a sweat. Right Now, and this is just in one use case. Think of us being able to do this across multiple institutions. Within a week, you're losing uh, almost uh, close to $120,000. Uh, now, this is a real case. Uh, that we observed as part of our uh, fraud controls, fraud mitigations, where within a very short period of time, uh, bad actors were able to siphon more than $100,000 uh, $100, $100, just because of micro deposits, just because they were able to generate the bots, just because they applied for loan services, they applied for checking accounts, savings accounts, cards, and so on and so forth. So instead of doing a traditional authentication through a phone, MFA, they went through a micro deposit route, they, they became richer with $100,000. So account takeover, another problem that uh, we are seeing. So there's a lot of nuances when it comes, uh, when it comes to bot attacks, when it comes to you leveraging the bot attack post our ability uh, to, purchase, uh, to purchase data which is up for grabs. Questions? Great. Um, compromise activity. There's a couple of uh, things that um, a uh, couple of models that we can work against compromise activities. Common point of compromise is one of the models that is uh, widely available right now in the market. Only, well, I would say widely available within several companies only. Um, um, SAS is one of the providers. IBM is the other provider. The nuance with that is the complexity of the computation, but also the, as I mentioned before, it has the, it, you need an SME to be able to decipher the information, to be able to ingest the right information into the model, and later on even decipher what is the outcome of the model. So um, having 
some kind of a compromise activity is absolutely critical for any kind of uh, account the moment, the, the moment a certain portfolio reach critical, uh, critical stages. What are we looking at in Galileo in general? Um, we're looking at client appeal, benefits, one single platform that will potentially embed all the solutions that we just, uh, we just discussed. Solution for KYC, to have a one single client journey that will potentially enable us to look at the KYC transactions, uh, adding the funds, disbursing the funds, and so on in one single, uh, one single platform. Fully automated solution. The more people we have in the tool, sometimes it might be working for our benefit, but what we realized is some of the automated solutions and the ability to have them dynamic benefit to the clients uh, much more. So some of those use cases we'll be able to see with some of our clients in the, in the very, very, near, uh, very near future. Um, all in one service, think of it as a single API that comes to address pretty much everything. You don't have to worry about integrating with third party provider, fourth party provider, calling EWS, calling uh, uh, Twilio for client notifications and so forth. And obviously the, the, the client appeal, as I said, it's a zero effort. Uh, we're already getting all the information from a lot of our clients. We're, uh, we have the transactional data, we have the money movement data. It, again, it almost becomes a crime not to use uh, one single API for, uh, for all of it. For clients who are not Galileo clients as well, it's also the ability to, we, we have the ability to expose some of those capabilities to them uh, as well. Uh, very, recent, uh, uh, very recent announcement that we made uh, with, uh, with Galileo. So again, some of that becomes very appealing to a, lot of, uh, to a lot of our clients, a lot of our prospects. What are we trying to do? What is our goal? Foundation will be our analytics. We have to have the right analytics, we have to have the right reporting and the infrastructure to provide, uh, to provide any kind of uh, risk-related uh, activities, uh, analytics. Compliance risk management becomes a paramount. Do we have the ability to submit SARS if needed? So, uh, there is a major need for this uh, in the industry and we are trying to accommodate for this as well. Money movement risk and the, and the transactional risk component. So going forward, it is something that we are trying to embed into one single, uh, one single client journey. The money movement, the transaction, the KYC, and obviously the client, um, the client communication. All of those are somewhat tied together. The moment there is a disbursement of funds, I would like to notify my client. The moment there is a fraudulent activity, I would like to validate it with my client. A lot of those activities can be addressed by as simple as, hey Max, were you the one to make the transaction? Yeah, you're an A. Based on the feedback, we can know how to proceed. Um, but again, I just want to highlight that all of this thing can only be possible if we have the right analytical framework and analytical structure, analytical reporting to be able to run all of those, uh, all of those uh, activities. With that being said, questions? How do we learn about this Galileo thing to set platform? Like what is it exactly? Like, what, I will, are the, what are the products and pieces that you guys are? Absolutely. Building? I can... I can have a separate session with you and show you exactly what are the components on the FinSec, what, what comes as part of the data elements, uh, the money movement, and so with whatever we just discussed, and as well as how you can integrate into a single solution. If you're, for example, if you're a Galileo client, how you can integrate into a single solution through one single API. If you're not a Galileo client, what are additional things we potentially might partner with you to ingest information from your side to make your solution better? So yeah, I'm more than happy to have this as a separate session with you. Absolutely. Max, not a question, but I, I know some of the uh, numbers that you shared were a little hard to see through there. So I just want to make sure everyone knows um, before you share that information for the registrants. Uh, so you'll get that data. Yeah. My apologies, the, the lighting could have been a little bit better or the, the reflection from the screen. But one of the, like I said, one of the constant things that you're observing is the fraud and the risk is on the rise. It's continuously on the rise, and the fact that there is going to be a tenfold investment in the technology around the risk and around the fraud actually should be very concerning, just because it's an indicator that the fraud is not actually going to be lower. The fraud is going to increase. With the increase in fraud, there is a obviously need for a much better capabilities, much better technology, much, uh, much proactive approach around uh, the mitigations. I think there was you know, some of the responsibility was also for the banks because uh, in the past they were so eager to sell products. Remember the whole best part where they started yep. getting all these false accounts of people who hadn't even asked for that account. Uh, so it was in their interest to have more accounts so you know put less concrete.
controls. <coughs> and it's, it's interesting that you mentioned the Wells Fargo use case because, well, first you would expect from financial institution not to, uh, not to uh, be in this kind of uh, practice, that's one. But on the, same, uh, uh, on the same side, all the major financial institutions trying to link their bank activity together. So if I have a traditional bank account with uh, Wells Fargo, I would expect that under the same PII, under the same social security and the name, I would expect to see all of those linked together. So it evolved actually a little bit beyond a traditional scheme of opening a regular account. It is creating some kind of a great wall between what is the genuine account versus what is the fake account, right? Not, not having the ability to see those together. Like we all have bank accounts with major banks, right? Like if you open another account, you most likely will see it under the same, under the same login and uh, credentials. So it went way beyond this activity. Not surprising that we issued a, a regulatory compl uh, complaints, right? So the, the controls will be more strict, but it's not just the data exposure, it's also the it's the engineering, it's the operational scheme that we're involved in this entire scheme, so which, which makes it so much more complicated. So, absolutely. Do you have any experience with dark web monitoring? We do. Um, we don't offer, we don't have this capability right now with Galileo. It's something that we are planning as part of our roadmap. Uh, we do have partnerships that have the ability to monitor dark webs, which is great. Um, the question remains is, what are the data elements we are going to monitor, Wesley? So, yeah, how important do you see that? It's interesting. It's, 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 a, it's a nuanced question. Um, here's why. Even within the dark web, there's a segregation between uh, the subprime clientele, to the regular, and the uh, upscale. So for subprime, most likely there is very little information that will be shared just because it's not so much lucrative. Unfortunately, right? most of the information that you will see is around uh, prime, uh, prime plans. But by the way, data breaches covers all of it. So it's critical to monitor, but we also have to be aware of what exactly we are monitoring uh, from the client perspective. Are we monitoring the PII information? Are we monitoring the accounts that are being up for grabs? Are we monitoring the card numbers? Unfortunately, the card numbers are also there available, uh, right? The only thing that, as, as we observed, not available potentially might be the CVV, right? So what exactly we are monitoring? Is it the PAN 16, the expiration date? And now we have to be very cautious about the CVV part that we can put on a continuous monitoring within our platform, or it is the overall experience of the customer. Max, like first name, last name, social, and so on. Uh, but I can provide you with some more details what, what we can do around this uh, front. Um, we do have great partners to work on this uh, with us. Mm -hmm.